Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another Center on Technology and Disability webinar. My name is John Newman. I'm an Assistive Technology Specialist with PACER Center, one of the three proud partners um, of this project. And today we are so excel excited to welcome AT Specialist Shelley Haven. Um, the title of today's presentation is Note-Taking Technologies for Middle School, High School, and Beyond. And note-taking is one of those interesting topics in the field. Some topics in this field, we wish there were kind of more options available and more strategies available. Note-taking is one of those um, topics where students these days have so many different um, tools at their disposal and so many different strategies. So we couldn't be more happy to be welcoming someone like Shelly here today to give us an overview of today's latest and greatest tools um, and strategies for note-taking. Um, for those of you that don't know, Shelly um, works at a consulting firm and she specializes in serving individuals with learning and other disabilities that um, affect executive functioning. Without further ado, I'll hand it over to Shelly here and she'll get us started. Okay, hello everybody. And obviously we've still got, uh, you know, constant, uh, uh, a number of people still rolling here. Uh, anyway, so uh, we're obviously going to be talking about uh, note-taking today. And um, uh, one of the first things I'm actually going to be doing is to make sure that we're all on the same page as to what we mean when we say note-taking. I hope to broaden your, um, um, broaden your definition of that word. Um, and uh, first, just uh, a little bit about, just so you know who, who uh, you're talking to here or who you're listening to here. Um, so I'm a, uh, I've been in this for just, a, in AT for just about uh, three decades now, um, mainly for the uh, last 15 years focusing on um, um, AT for learning differences, executive functioning, and uh, ADHD, although during my career I've actually covered pretty much all disabilities, all age groups. Um, and I do have a lot of experience with um, uh, these various needs at the college level because I used to head up assistive technology at Stanford. Um, so anyway, I mean, this is, this, this is one of the areas that I'm most interested in. That's why I like researching uh, this stuff. So um, <clears throat> first of all, I want to point out that um, uh, the, the reason note-taking is so intriguing to me is it's almost, uh, especially when you get into the college level, it's almost an academic survival skill. Um, you need to be, I mean, education at its core is you're being exposed to new information, new perspectives or whatever. You can't possibly hold on to everything in your head, so you're going to have to capture that information for later consideration. Uh, the problem with note-taking, whether it's in class or in other, um, uh, you know, other scenarios that we'll go over, um, is that it often involves a number of different cognitive processes that have to take place simultaneously, which is difficult for most people. And then if you uh, have that situation compromised because of learning differences or executive function problems, uh, then it becomes even uh, much more difficult. Mm. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So um, what I'm going to do is I, I'm first talk about taking of the notes and then broaden the definition into something that I call knowledge management, all right? So when we think about um, taking notes, especially in class, we're referring to capturing ideas, or ca capturing information that is being presented to us uh, externally, but also capturing our own responses to that information, our own ideas and thoughts um, and stuff like that. And uh, the intent is to um, the intent is to use that information uh, later to you know quickly refer to like a set of grammar rules or how do I solve that type of math problem or maybe we just need it for reference to uh, you know retrieve quickly like a class schedule um, maybe we're going to review it later to study for a test maybe we need to practice the same information over and over again so that we can uh, memorize it. Um, maybe we're going to repurpose the information for using in a research report. And by the way, it was just coincidence that all those little bullet points happen to start with an R. I actually didn't plan it that way. Um, so, um, but the value in taking notes is not mainly in the taking of the notes, but in the using of the notes. So in order for those notes to be really useful, 
Um, we also need to be able to organize that incoming information and our thoughts in a way that makes sense. We need to be able to quickly find what we need and also be able to apply that information for any of the you know, taking notes tasks I listed above. So <clears throat> in order for note taking to be effective, um, we need to consider these other aspects of knowledge management. Um, so I, I, I say note taking is the first step of knowledge management, which I define as capturing and organizing what you learn so that you can readily find and use that knowledge when needed. And if you'll notice, the four key words there are capture, organize, find, and use, which brings us to what I refer to as the core of an effective knowledge management system, um, which is to capture, organize, retrieve, and employ. So these are, when you're thinking about tools, but also strategies to help with note-taking, I would suggest that you consider these four different aspects. Um, uh, first of all, capturing. What is the information that is important to capture? How will you go about capturing that? If you think about a typical uh, classroom, um, you know, the student is, I'll, I'll just be honest, being bombarded with visual information. Some students obviously process visual better than others. You've got a lot of auditory information, whether it's lecture, discussion, etc. There's text, which is not only handouts, books, maybe something on the web. Also, I probably should have added on that, um, uh, you know, information that's presented on the front screen. That's also text. And then you've got your own personal thoughts and observations that you're having to convert into language to either type it or handwrite it. You're making drawings, maybe a voice recording. Um, so those are all the different aspects to consider with regard to the capture part. But in order for those things to be useful, I need to organize these. I've got a ton of information coming in in different classes, uh, from reading I'm doing, etc. How do I organize and store that to be useful? Do I have a you know automatic organization system that puts things uh, in the right places, or do I do this manually? Um, uh, how am I going to retrieve the information that I need when I need it? Uh, one thing you'll find when I um, uh, talk about like uh, digital notebooks and some other options is that you can digitally flag this information so that you can say, you know, bring up everything that's related to my research report and it'll automatically pull that in. That's one of the beauties of dealing with digital note taking. And then finally, give some thought as to how am I going to use this information later? How am, I going, how am I going to employ it? So for instance, if you know you're going to use it for studying or review, you may want to take it in a way that facilitates self-testing. And toward the end, I'll, I'll show you a way to do that, actually using inspiration. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're going to repurpose it for use in a report, it's important that you capture, may perhaps automatically capture where that information came from. So this is what I refer to as the core of an effective knowledge management system. The note-taking part is kind of like the capture aspect on the top there, all right? So we're going to look at, um, <clears throat> at tools for three different scenarios. Uh, one is taking notes in class, <clears throat> and if you consider um, like I said before, all the different types of information that have to be processed uh, and the, the student needing to, uh, you know, process those different types of information, but also um, uh, to decide what's important, what's not. Um, they need to monitor what they're doing, and this is all happening under a time constraint. The student has no control over the pace at which the you know, class uh, instruction is moving along and has less control over distractions. So that can be kind of challenging. Um, then we're going to look at self-study, uh, which is um, you know, reading books, articles, stories, uh, doing web research, etc. And you have some control over the time there and some control over the distractions, but there's no inherent structure to that. So you, have to, you have to apply your own structure. And then uh, lastly, which is kind of a subset of self-study, is a personal knowledge bank. A lot of what students learn, they're going to need to reapply in the future. Um, you know, a year from now, after I've learned how to write a persuasive essay, okay, how do I write a persuasive essay again? Uh, you know, what was that trigonometric identity, sine squared plus cosine squared equals one? So the idea of, of having this kind of easy, uh, easy to use access to prior information, that's another form of note taking, all right? 
So um, just a little caveat here. I always use this slide in my presentations, and I refer to it as the technology iceberg to essentially say that, uh, you know, there's a lot of other tech tools that we're not going to be referring to here. And um, we're just referring, we're, we're just going to touch the top of the, you know, iceberg and actually probably the tip of the tip of the iceberg. Um, if you want to uh, look for other tools, so I'm just going to show you some examples for those three different scenarios, but there's lots of other stuff out there. All right. Um, so if you do want some more information or on any of the stuff that I talk about or um, uh, tools that I haven't talked about, if you go uh, to my website, so it's um, uh, www.techpotential.net, tech potential being short for technology to unlock potential. I don't know why it split the line at the slash A there, but it's supposed to be slash AT toolbox. Um, anyway, um, if you go to that page on my website, uh, you will see a whole slew of different tools for different aspects of learning. Uh, so what you're looking at here um, on the page is just, um, you know, just part of this very long web page on my website, all right? So, uh, you see, I can move this little green arrow around. Isn't that cool? So, uh, I'll just turn it off. So, anyway, so the first thing we need to look at is what are the, um, you know, what are different aspects of uh, learning and attention and executive functions that get in the way of uh, note-taking? Because the type of tool and strategy we use is uh, much going to be tied to what is the obstacle we're trying to get past? So this is just a sample list. It doesn't include everything on there, but it's to give you something to think about. Um, you know, the, a very obvious one would be dysgraphia, visual motor coordination issues, where the student uh, can't write fast enough, legibly enough, to get information down. Um, typing obviously helps with that, if the student knows how to type. Um, auditory processing and processing speed is another important one. Very often, uh, like I work with a lot of students who have fantastic verbal comprehension and auditory, uh, you know, skills, um, but the problem is they have very slow auditory processing speed, and because you have no control over the, um, you have no control over the rate at which auditory information is coming at you in class, um, if you didn't get it down when it happened, um, you may miss it. So the idea of, uh, you know, how can we address that? Uh, working memory is very definitely used, uh, that's uh, one of the executive functions, is very definitely used when um, uh, taking notes because you're having to hold information in your in auditory um, uh, working memory or visual working memory so that you can manipulate it and then write it or type it or distill it. Uh, so working memory definitely comes into play. Um, recognizing the important points, and I'm sure that a lot of you are quite familiar with this, either as teachers or as parents or as students, is uh, how do I even know, you know, should I just write down everything the teacher says? Uh, and, and understanding the big picture in order to know what to, um, uh, what to capture and what's really, you know, kind of irrelevant. Um, um, Attention issues, inability to focus, like, uh, you know, after you've listened to me for an hour and a half, uh, you probably don't want to listen to me anymore. And you might, you might miss certain things. So, um, uh, obviously, ADHD, especially for um, auditory information, um, um, can be a challenge. Um, then, uh, let's see, um, uh, disorganization, impatience, I mentioned a few things there. And then the long-term retrieval issue, like something I learned last year, but now I need to apply it now, how do I get that information? How do I pull that back up if I didn't write it down and don't know how to find it in my notes? All right, so um, there are four slides, four summary slides in my presentation, which you have in the handout. And for those who have, I, I did notice on the side, a few people have been asking about the copies of the slides. If you look down in the bottom of your window there, um, you will see, um, uh, you'll see a thing that says Shelley Haven handout, download Tech for Notes handout. That has a copy of almost all of the slides in this presentation, not all of them. Um, some of them I'm just using just to make a point, all right? And um, so you'll have like slides like this uh, for reference later. But there are four summary slides for these four different um, scenarios, um, and you can use that for reference. 
Um, so the, I have two different strategies for taking notes in class, and I've put them into two very broad categories. The first one is how can we use technology and associated strategies to reduce, um, to reduce the physical and cognitive effort of note taking. As I mentioned, note taking in class involves a lot of different simultaneous cognitive processes, and usually what happens is, well, I can listen or I can write, but I can't do both. Okay, so anything we can do to reduce the physical and cognitive effort of note-taking can help. So I'm going to talk about um, using a note-taking template, which is also referred to as guided note-taking, to provide a framework for new information and also cue the student as, as to what am I actually looking for? What, what does the teacher think is important? Um, and you can use a word processor outline provided by the teacher, a graphic organizer outline, digital notebook for this. Then we're also going to talk about PDF annotation software. The idea there is the teacher provides, uh, or the professor, if it's in college, provides a copy of notes of, of the slides, let's say beforehand, such as the slides that you have for this um, presentation. And then all you're going to do is rather than having to, you know, scribe what's on the board or what's on the screen, um, all you're going to do is annotate that information, essentially put down your reflections um, on that. Um, taking pictures versus copying, that's always a wonderful uh, um, solution. Cameras are one of the most underused note-taking uh, tools around. We'll talk a little bit about that. And I've actually thrown in, for a reason I'll mention, assistive listening device for um, students with uh, various issues. <clears throat> so let's first look at a um, structured note-taking template. Okay, and the idea here is the teacher is going to provide, hopefully all students, not just those who have defined uh, challenges, um, with a basic framework in either paper or digital form of, um, you know, what, uh, uh, what we're going to talk about roughly in what order and maybe providing other organizational cues as to, um, uh, you know, what they ought to take notes on and obviously this framework is going to change based on the type of class or the, the you know, the uh, grade, you know, you might provide a different sort of framework for a fifth grader than you would for uh, juniors and seniors in high school. And um, if you happen to take notes digitally, then that kind of also sets up a situation I'll show you later that um, makes it easier to study and review those notes. So. Uh, so you, you don't have this particular slide in your uh, handout there. Um, but this is just something I very simple I created in Inspiration. I could have done this in Microsoft Word. Um, this is, uh, there's actually two parts to this. Uh, this is, I'll, I'll assume it's a fifth grade class. I realize we're talking middle school and above, but this is a fifth grade class and we're going to be studying about clouds today. And I've already kind of provided places to say, this is what you need to take away from this class. What are clouds made of? How are clouds formed? What are the different types of clouds? And you'll notice there are four spots there, meaning you, you ought to be listening for four different types of clouds. And the, um, you know, the second part of uh, this also provides places for the student to, um, um, to write down things that come up on, uh, you know, gee, I'd like to learn more about this. If they run into a place where they don't understand something, they can write that down to ask the teacher later. And I've even got a place for the assignment at the bottom here as well. All right. So um, again, all I'm doing is I'm framing the student's thinking about this incoming information. All right. Um, now, if a student happens to be more of a visual learner than a, um, uh, than a linear textual learner, they might do better with, let's say, a mind map or a cluster map of, um, um, as a note-taking guide. Well, this is one of the beauties. If you happen to create a note-taking guide and in inspiration, you can actually distribute it in four different ways, all right? So you can distribute it as paper or digital and in a graphic form or as an outline. So you're, you're meeting four different sets of student needs. How, how universal design of learning is that? So anyway. Um, so, uh, so this is a different type of um, note-taking template. This is actually taken from the digital notebook um, uh, OneNote, which we'll be talking about a lot later in the presentation. Uh, and this is a page in that digital notebook that is already pre-set up so that when information comes in, I'm writing down my 
uh, my notes about the lecture uh, topic right here. When I get out of class, I'm going to summarize the top two or three points, you know, my main takeaways from this. Uh, questions that I have, I have a preset place for that. When the teacher starts to talk about homework, I have a very, you know, consistent place to put that. Um, and it's just, just going to make studying a lot better later if you can take your notes in digital form. Of course, one of the other advantages to taking notes in digital form for students who might have, let's say, dyslexia as well, um, is that um, if this text is, uh, you know, is digital text you're creating, it can also be read aloud. Your own notes can be read aloud to you later using text-to-speech software, all right? So, um, uh, so the idea here is, so you've heard me mention strategies on several occasions. The, um, I'm a very firm believer is that technology is there to kind of serve the strategies. And this is especially true with note taking and also with anything that's, um, um, anything that's uh, executive function related is that is that you start with what is a good sound strategy and then say, how can I support or enhance tools with this, you know, um, support the strategies with those tools. So for instance, when you're talking about making a note taking template, the organizational structure in that template is likely going to be laid out differently depending on what the topic is. In literature, it's going to be important that we distill information about, you know, the characters and the setting and, um, you know, what particular quotes uh, that particular character said that are important. When we're talking about history, uh, it's going to be important to carry people, places, events, dates, and, and capture them in some sort of chronological order. Um, science is going to be different. Math, math is actually very different because it's very difficult to type math notes. You can do homework by typing math notes, but it's kind of difficult to um, um, kind of difficult to type them um, in class. Okay, so. Um, so the idea here is to use the technology to support sound strategies. Now, I would also suggest, and this has nothing to do with technology really, is that uh, if students are having difficulty with note taking, that you also think about just basic note taking skills. I've listed just a few down here. Um, the idea of not writing down everything in complete sentences, using uh, symbols and keywords and abbreviated words. Uh, not worrying about organization because that slows you down if you have to think about the mechanics of organization. And then um, um, if you type notes, it also makes reorganization uh, and, and putting it into some understandable framework later, it just makes it a lot easier. Um, so if we add strategies to our core, so we, now we've got strategies plus capture, organize, retrieve, and employ. Okay, um, anyway, the, um, uh, that spells out score, okay, so, anyway, um, so now let's look at another way to, uh, uh, you know, minimize the mechanical aspects of uh, taking notes, relieve the physical effort, is the idea of the teacher providing uh, slides, and, um, Anyway, the teacher providing the um, uh, uh, copies of the slides in advance as a PDF and just using PDF annotation software. So I've listed a couple here, a few here that are important to uh, recognize. And I'm going to show you uh, Adobe Acrobat DC and then also the PDF annotation portion of Read and Write for Google for those of you who are using Chromebooks or Chrome extensions in class. Okay. Um, and then... Um, uh, so let me just move on to that. I took some screenshots of this. So this is a different presentation. I just took examples of a different presentation I had done um, actually at Stanford recently on um, note-taking challenges. And we were looking at a case study for a student named uh, Leah. You can see her name up here. So this is a copy of the slides. And uh, so I've opened this in Acrobat Reader DC, which replaced Adobe Acrobat. Okay. And um, over on the side here, I have a number of different tools, and I'm going to click the comment button. And when I click the comment button, you'll notice that I get this dandy toolbar, this dandy 
toolbar that just showed up on the top here with all sorts of stuff in it. So I've got a little, um, a little comment tool on the side here. I've got, uh, I can highlight text using the highlighter. I can type text either in or not in a box using these two tools. Uh, I can draw or sketch. I can even record a voice note. This is kind of interesting. You can actually, you can actually paste a, a voice note, a recorded voice onto, um, uh, onto a PDF using Acrobat Reader, actually Adobe Reader, the earlier version as well. So uh, let me just show you a marked up version of this. So you'll notice that I have highlighted certain text in here. I've added my own comment. Um, this is kind of an interesting tool, it has an arrow on it that's found over here. So I can just, you know, quick make a note to myself of, hey, you got any recommendations for a, you know, single sheet scanner? And then all my annotations are tabulated or listed in order on the side here. So this can make an actually pretty dandy tool for um, marking up uh, notes, okay? Um, one of the other tools you might want to know about, if though, for those of you who may be already using Read and Write for Google, um, uh, in Google Docs, uh, because it has a number of different interesting tools. You may not know that there's a different toolbar that comes up if you open a PDF. So this is a copy of a couple of slides I did from an um, executive function workshop last year. And um, so I've got, let's see, I've got highlighting tools on the top here. So when I highlight text, like over here it says, uh, also see activation and attention section. So I've highlighted that. I just dragged my mouse over it. When I do that, this little um, uh, pop-up window comes up and I can highlight that in any of four different colors. So you can see I've done that up here. I've highlighted this in yellow. I can use the text tool, which is this thing over here, the big T, and I've added this text note. Um, and you'll also notice that I can actually add text notes using speech recognition, that little headset tool you see there uh, actually allows me to use speech recognition to enter information and I can use text to speech to listen to this and then this uh, little thumbtack tool over here allows me to add a longer piece of text and it's just marked by this little like a push pin over on the side here. So again teachers provide students with um, um, you know copies of the PDF slides and you can use these rather robust annotation tools to mark this up. So, anyway, um, so uh, yeah, I see somebody, uh, somebody asked on the side here, is that Acrobat Reader or Acrobat Pro? Um, yeah, the, um, it used to be, um, it used to be, most people are familiar with Adobe Reader, which is the, is the uh, free thing you could always download. Well, Adobe Reader, the last version of that was version 11. They discontinued that last year and they replaced it with, Acrobat Reader DC. For all practical purposes, it's just a new version of Adobe Reader. It's still free, um, but it's called Acrobat Reader, and that complements Acrobat Pro. Okay. So uh, just a couple of other things to think about is that uh, for instructors who are using electronic whiteboards, all electronic whiteboard software has... Um, uh, has screen capture and even video capture tools built into it. So you can see on the side here, I showed uh, um, you know where to find that tool in um, Smart Notebook software and in Active Inspire. Okay, and um, anyway, so the um, uh, hold on, I'm just <laughs> I just thought of something else here. So I, I I kind of got my own train of thought derailed there for a second. Sorry. So um, if, if the teacher is using an electronic whiteboard, you can, um, uh, this is an appropriate accommodation to say, hey, you know, I'd like screenshots from the board. Uh, for those teachers who might want to actually release an entire video with audio of the section, um, anyway, the, they can, um, you know, the, the, these, these, uh, um, pieces of software that come with the electronic whiteboards actually have that capability built in. Uh, poor man's version of uh, taking pictures of the whiteboard is use a digital camera, um, which is actually what I talk about on the next slide, is 
to think about all the different ways in which you can use a uh, digital camera. Um, visual images, especially for uh, students where that's their strength, that kind of reinforces understanding and retention. And it's also a lot less taxing on working memory uh, to just take a picture of something. Of course, if you just take a picture of it and then don't put it somewhere, that could be a problem. So that's why I mentioned on the bottom here, it would be good to have a larger note-taking thing um, that where you can drop any of these pictures. So you can see on the side here, I've taken a picture of the board. Um, I've taken a picture of a lab setup. Uh, and once I get those pictures at the end of the day, I'm going to drop those into my digital notebook, which we'll get to later in the presentation. So this particular section, I talked about um, you know, reducing the physical and all these things were made excuse me, meant to reduce the physical and cognitive effort of note-taking. Well, for a student with ADHD, and especially as a problem with um, auditory attention, trying to attend when there's other stuff going on in the classroom can take an incredible amount of cognitive effort. It can. And uh, for those people who have ADHD, they can tell you as much. In other words, it's taking me everything I, you know, it's taking me all my brain power just to stay focused. I haven't got time for taking notes. I haven't got the, the energy left to take notes. And uh, so the idea of using an assistive listening device can actually reduce that cognitive load. Um, it can also help students who have um, uh, auditory processing uh, issues. Um, the older style systems, and I'll just pull up my little green arrow here again. The, the older style systems, the teacher is going to wear, you know, your typical lapel mic and uh, wireless setup, and then the um, the student would wear a set of headphones or earbuds plugged into a receiver. Newer systems are um, uh, work off of uh, Bluetooth. Um, you can have just a little earpiece that you're wearing, and the teacher is transmitting with a, uh, um, uh, you know, with a separate, very small device. I had one student I worked with; she had long, dark hair, and um, the teacher had a very indiscreet little Bluetooth transmitting mic um, uh, that she would wear. The student wore this little, what looked like a Bluetooth earpiece, in one ear under her hair, nobody even knew she was receiving the teacher's voice directly through this uh, system, kind of bypassing uh, distractions in the classroom. So that can really help with regard to, um, you know, auditory uh, problems. So I, I, I'm looking here over on the side in the chat, and I see all sorts of interesting conversations. I'm going to have to go read those later. So <laughs> anyway. The, um, so let's move into the second category, which is taking notes in class. And what we're going to do, like I said, you've got all sorts of types of information um, coming here. Is uh, visual, auditory, textual, um, your own thoughts and stuff. Um, how can I capture more of the presentation so that I can refer to it later? So uh, with regard to audio, you could certainly record. So, you know, capturing audio, to use the C in the word core, capturing audio instruction is very easy. You use a digital audio recorder. But then when you have to retrieve information from that, remember the R in core, that's very difficult with the digital audio recorder because you don't know where to go in the recording. So that's where tools like the LiveScribe pen and various digital notebooks and iPad apps uh, come into play. So uh, let's go ahead and take a look at that. So um, the LiveScribe pen um, is um, it's essentially a, a digital, you can think of it as just a fat pen with a digital audio recorder. So in this uh, particular picture I'm, I'm showing here, the, the uh, microphone is right here. And in the end of the pen, I'm going to go to the next slide here. In the end of the pen is a little infrared camera. And that camera is looking at a very uh, almost, uh, it's not quite microscopic, but a very fine dot pattern on the page. You can see I've enlarged this little section of the page. And it looks like random dots. It actually isn't. It's, uh, it's a mathematical algorithm that um, is unique over the whole page and throughout the notebook. So when the infrared camera sees that and the computer and the pen sees that, it knows exactly where it is on the page, what orientation the pen is in, um, when I'm touching the pen to the paper, and it's also recording my notes. I'm going to go back one slide again. So it's recording the audio, it's recording the notes, 
and it's linking the two together. So actually what I'm going to do here, and we'll, we'll see if this uh, works properly. Uh, Andy, uh, in case I run into a problem, I'm going to look to you for help. All right. So I'm going to go to live uh, for my computer. I'm going to be sharing my screen. And uh, turn on a light here. All right, so you're seeing my screen, and I'm going to open up. Uh, this is something for later I want to show you. So you're looking at my live scribe. So Andy, can you see the screen there okay? Yes, Shelly. Um... Okay, so I just wanted to make sure everybody could see what I'm doing. And I believe here. everyone else is seeing it too. Yes, okay. So um, anyway, so this is uh, so this is my live scribe pen. As you can tell out here on the on the west coast, it's 205. <laughs> and uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit a button at the bottom of the screen. I don't know if you could let me see if I can help you to see that. So there's little buttons on the bottom of the page here, and I'm going to hit the record button with the pen. Now let's go back up over here, and I'm going to refocus this. You can see what I'm doing. So the idea here is I am uh, taking notes, and I'm left-handed, so I'm going to have to hook my hand around. So I'm, I'm uh, taking uh, my notes in class, and it's recording, as you can tell right there. It says recording. And uh, so what the LiveScribe pen does is it um, records my... Um, uh, it records my notes that I'm taking, my handwritten notes. It also records audio. But the key thing is it links the two things together. All right. Now, why would that come in handy? It seems like kind of a keen parlor trick. But think about this. The teacher, uh, uh, everybody's packing up at the end of the class. And the teacher says, oh, let me tell you about your assignment for tomorrow. Uh, let me just go over this really quickly. And uh, so as soon as you hear the word assignment, you're going to write down your code for assignment, which is an A with a circle around it. And then the teacher says, uh, uh, OK, the first part of your assignment, let me just write a 1 there. First part of your assignment is such and such. And then uh, the second thing I want you to do, I'll just write a 2. So I'm just listening. I'm not going to write anything down. And then the third part of your assignment is 3 or whatever. So now at the end of the evening, uh, when I when I get home, I can re-listen to that information by just touching that note. And it's going to replay the audio from what it was listening to when I wrote that. So I'm just going to touch that A, and then I'm going to have to hold the, um, the pen itself up to my microphone so you can hear it. Do that again. Okay, so let me hit the, if I just hit the two. Okay, so I just stopped that there. So the idea here is, so how can I make use of this? So like one of the strategies that I teach uh, students is that when they have uh, slides being presented on the screen, just keep a running list of those slides along the left-hand margin. So as soon as slide 14 gets presented, I'm just going to write a 14 on the side. When slide 15 gets presented, I'm going to do a slide 15. So now when I get home, and of course I have a copy of the slides, and I say, gee, I didn't really understand what the teacher was saying um, in slide 14, I can just go back and touch that note, and it'll take me to exactly that place in the audio recording. So let's go back to our main screen here and say stop sharing. And then let's see, and then I'm going back to this layout, I think. So it should be showing slides again here. And apparently it takes a few seconds to load. OK, so now we're back to the slides. Um, anyway, so um, you know this can come in very handy. And I'm going to skip forward a few slides here, all right? Um, let me go past notability for the moment. And this is that strategy that I was talking about. The idea is for LiveScribe or any of the uh, couple of other tools I'm going to show you here is um, 
I, I take kids through actually a, um, a worksheet where we work out and they say, based on you having taken notes in the past, what are those sort of places that you'd want to go back to and, um, you know, listen to, uh, you know, listen to uh, notes? And, uh, you know, certainly if the, where the teacher talks about the assignment or what the main points are, uh, defining a glossary word, um, gee, I didn't understand that. So I suggest that students have a, um, have, uh, you know, codes that they write down for that. Where did my little green arrow go? Here we go. Is, uh, so for instance, if you don't understand a certain place in the notes, maybe your symbol is write down a question mark with a circle around it and then leave extra space to add notes later. Um, you already saw me use the example of the assignment. So I can take very abbreviated notes and still be able to refer back to exactly that place in the audio recording. Um, and then, of course, I'm actively listening for those things. And then this, uh, this was a cool, this third one here after, um, was um, really kind of neat. Uh, an eighth grader gave me this idea that what she does is after she's used a live scribe for recording in class, and as she's leaving class, while everything is still fresh in her mind, she talks directly into the pen and just gives, again, while everything's fresh in her mind, records her own thoughts on what were the three main takeaways from this class. What are the three main things that I learned? So when she goes to study, let's say a week, two weeks, a month later, the very first thing she's going to listen to is herself a month earlier saying, here's what I got out of this class. So I thought that was actually a very clever idea. So I'm going to go back a few slides here now. And again, these slides for people who joined us late, these uh, uh, most of these slides, not every single one of them, are, are in the handout um, that um, uh, is at the bottom of your screen where it says download Tech for Notes handout. So you can see most you don't have to write down everything on the screen. I've included a lot of this information for reference purposes. So Notability is another uh, tool. It's probably the most popular uh, iPad app for note taking. And it has a number of different um, uh, things built into it. So you can essentially capture handwriting, drawing, typing, audio word processing uh, tools such as uh, you know bullet points and outline and stuff like that. Um, you can insert uh, different media. Um, from the web, etc. cetera. Uh, it even has an organizational system built in, and it auto-syncs uh, through Dropbox, and I believe also um, <clears throat> Google Drive now, uh, to, um, uh, to your computer. If you have a Mac, you can also access Notability uh, directly on a Mac as well. So this is a, uh, I'm just going to show you a couple of screenshots here. Um, this actually is slightly different than the current version, but you'll you, you'll get the gist of it here. So here are my my subjects. Let's say my classes along the side here, and then in each of these different classes, so here's one class here. Here are my different pages of notes. All right. So let's go to the notes page. So here's a here's a notes page, and uh, you'll notice that um, on the top here, if I want to type. I can uh, just click the typing tool. If I want to draw, I can click the drawing tool. I can highlight text. Um, if I go over to the plus tool, this uh, has a number of other features, one of which is take a picture. So right in the middle of taking notes, I could hold up my iPad, take a picture of the board, and go right back to taking notes. But the key point for me is this audio record tool, where what I can do is very similar to the live scribe I just showed you here. I could click that and it will record and it will link all of my handwritten notes um, and my typing and the pictures you take to the audio recording so that later you could say click on that picture and it'll take you to exactly what it was listening to at that moment. So what you've done is you've captured all these different pieces and you've integrated them for easy reference later which is very important for uh, students with various um, uh, memory issues. So, um, and then again, that same sort of strategy uh, that I mentioned for LiveScribe can be used in any of those other tools as well that record and, and link uh, audio and notes. Okay, so I also wanted to show you about another uh, tool. It's probably more useful for students in college uh, because there's a number of different parts for this. I mean, I can't see a middle schooler using this. It's just... Um, 
uh, there's a lot of different things going on. Let's put it this way. It's called uh, Sonascent Audio Note Taker. And um, it has a very interesting way of integrating uh, audio and slides and your own notes that you're writing. And to be honest, it's actually easier to show this to you than to, um, uh, than to just talk about it. Um, so what, I, what I'd like to do here is on the next slide, I'm just going to show you, I'm going to point out some things as to what you'll be seeing on the screen, and then we're going to view a short video on this, all right? So, um, so you'll see in the audio note taker uh, framework, I have, I have four columns. You'll notice in the first column over here on the left, these are the slides. So the teachers provided me with slides beforehand, and I've already input those. Uh, I just do an import, and it just automatically creates sections, one per each slide. There are three, or up to, depending on which ones you want, three other columns. There's a reference column, a text column, and an audio column. So if I wanted to, in the reference column, I could tell it, lift all the accessible text out of this slide and place it in the reference column. So I could do that, or I could use it for another purpose. All right. And um, uh, in the text column is where I'm going to put my own notes. And then the audio column is like, okay, what are all those colored bars? Those colored bars represent audio. They're referred to as audio phrases. Okay. And um, so when a person is talking, you'll see a bar. When they stop talking, you'll notice there's, there's a big space there. There's no bar. So it's kind of a, uh, let's see, what did I call it here? It's kind of a visual metaphor of recorded audio. So what you can do is because you're getting visual representation of all the audio in here, you can then highlight that visual representation. You see this section over here that um, whoever was taking these notes highlighted this section of audio in red and red over here on the side says this is important okay and uh, you can take your own notes over here so it'll probably be easiest if i just show you a short um uh, demonstration over here and so i'm going to go to the videos andy so again if there is an issue um i'm going to look to you for help uh okay so we're, we're going to do visual all right, so we're going to play the video, and then hopefully you'll be able to hear this. So now I'm going to start recording, okay, so I, I just, and I'll like... Okay, I just stopped the video. I just want to show you. So this is a slightly different uh, presentation here. And she has on the left-hand side, it's the slides, and then she's going to be talking and describing audio note taker, and you'll see the stuff come up on the right. Okay, so now let's go back to that. Recording, I'll explain the recording. Start recording, I'll explain the recording as I go. We have several microphone options, and for recording live, we're going to choose mic so now, so now see, all right, we're getting two versions of this playing simultaneously. And as you can see there, if I stop speaking, okay, I'm looking to you, Andy, to fix the problem. Break. Okay. So the audio is recorded in chunks okay. of information. So the audio is recorded in chunks of information. And this will keep going. It will record in very, very long bars. And this will keep going. It will record in very, very long bars. If I don't breathe, and it will give me short. I'm getting I feedback from somebody who's speaking to me. I can start to then record them when I can say now the lecture is talking about this bit of information. I have your mic. All right, I'm, I'm stopping it because obviously this isn't, um, <laughs> this isn't working as intended here. Shelly, uh, I think so if I'm you going to go back and lay out here with the slides. I don't. I don't think it's coming for me, though. Um, Sally, you, you need to turn off your computer speaker um, while I'm playing. But anyway, so um, the 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 and, uh, so I'll just use this. Yeah. Well, somebody else's computer speaker may be on. I, I don't know. Um, so we're gonna try it again. 
so I can say now the lecturer is talking so I can say about now the lecturer is talking that I about here, this bit of information that I have here that I already decided was important. And you can see it's going to keep colouring everything, red, until until keep keep everything, everything red until and I tell it to, it to do otherwise. otherwise. And to do otherwise, I can do so. Okay, Andy, we're, we're quitting that. <laughs> Thanks, Andy. 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 Thanks, Andy.
So what we want to do is the equivalent of what I just showed you, but do it with eTech. So many different um, uh, literacy and learning uh, tools have uh, all sorts of annotation capabilities, uh, highlighters, notes, etc., even voice notes um, built in. So I'm going to show you a couple of videos um, of that. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about strategies, because strategies, um, using all these annotation tools without a strategy really isn't all that helpful. Okay, so uh, I'm going to go back to uh, videos here again. All right. And this time we're going to look at a different video here. I'll, I'll do this. Fortunately, all the other, uh, the other videos uh, do not have sound on them, so that's fine. So we won't have a problem with the... Uh, with the feedback, okay? So I'm going to, let's see, I'll enlarge this video. So we're going to be looking at, this is Kurzweil 3000, and I'm showing you, uh, I'm trying to think, this is on, on a PC. All right, so let's go, just go ahead and play this. And I'll, I'll narrate as I'm going along here. So uh, you'll see up in the uh, toolbar on the top, uh, there's all sorts of, um, Hold on a minute. I'm going to stop the video and I'm going to use my pointer to say up on the top here there are all sorts of uh, markers. So I've got different color markers. There's actually a few I'm not showing. I can add a footnote. I can add a sticky note. I can add a text note, even a voice note. So uh, Kurzweil has like a whole slew of different types of tools. All right. And um, so what I'm going to do here is just play the video and you will see me. Um, you know, kind of going through and highlighting uh, text. Once I get done pointing out things in the top in there. There we go. So I'm going to use my yellow highlighter, and I, I decided I'm going to put all my headers in yellow. Okay, so I'm just going to highlight that text there. And as I'm reading this e-text, I decide that the main points of each paragraph I'm going to decide to put in green. So. We're talking about time travel, and time is relative is kind of important. So, and also, time doesn't tick by everywhere at a constant speed. Okay, so we can stop this video. Now I'm going to show you the kind of Julia Child take it out of the oven fully baked version. Okay, where I've completely marked up this text. So this is the second video. Yeah, because, because chefs on TV, that's what they do. They take the thing out after it's baked at 375 for, you know, 45 minutes or whatever. So what I've done here is I've, I've employed a markup strategy where I've marked up all my headers in yellow, all right? And um, then I've, I've decided that I'm going to put all the main points in green. Let me turn on my highlighter here again. I've, so as I'm reading and I'm marking up the, the main points in green, if I come across a word that I don't know and I need to look up the definition, I've circled that in red. Um, I've added, and Kurzweil has something called bubble notes, so I've asked some questions of myself in a bubble note. I've added a sticky note to myself to say, add this to my bibliography on the side here. So I've, I've really kind of gone to town, all right? Um, doing this, but what is really nice about using tools that have um, annotation capabilities like this built in, and you'll see this in a second here, is that I can extract my highlights to a separate document. So let's just pause here for a second. And um, <clears throat> so what you're looking at here is I can tell it which annotations to extract and do I want to indent these? So using my strategy of yellow was headings, green was main ideas, blue was sub main ideas, let's say. Um, and I'm going to indent those by zero inches, half an inch, one inch. So you could, you could tell I'm, what I'm doing is I'm setting up an outline. This becomes a study outline. Um, and I'm going to tell it here. So I can do bookmarks, I can do the heading. I'm just going to race forward through this for a second. And I'm going to click OK. The OK button, and it's going to extract all my hybrid document. This becomes my study guide. It's doing this in the background. I'm going to wait till it gets done. There we go. So, so there's my study guide. Study guide. 
um, but it's already kind of pre-arranged in an outline form. Now, different software has, uh, I'm going to go back to the slides at this point here. Different software has different tools. So you'll remember I showed you Read and Write for Google before. Um, it, has, uh, um, it has its own subset of like four different colored highlighters and the ability to add notes as well. Um, you know, if you use Win software on a PC, it's going to have a different set of tools. So I'd suggest that what you do is, um, you know, look at each of those tools and see um, what you actually need in order to, you know, take text such as what you see on the left and extract it into a segment as you see on the right. So that's one way of capturing information. So you heard me mention strategies. Strategies to me are incredibly important because if you're just, I've seen students, I'm sure you have too, or you may be a student who doesn't know, well, what is it I'm supposed to highlight in here? And you end up highlighting like half the text in the book. So the idea of having, of coupling those tools, whether you're doing it manually with actual highlighters in a physical book, or you're doing this with digital text and digital highlighters and such, is to make sure that you have what I refer to as an active reading strategy. So I've listed on this page, it's mainly for reference, I'm not going to go through it in detail, um, is a, a very popular strategy that's taught, gee, all the way through school, and I've even seen classes at the college level uh, for this, called SQ3R. That stands for Survey, Question, Read, Recite, Review. There's a very similar strategy that you'll see in, I put it in blue, a little bit smaller text, called PQRST, which is very similarly Preview, Question, Read, Summarize, and Self-Test. And the idea is that the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to look over the text. I'm not going to read it. I'm just going to look and see what's there, see how long it is, look at what the headings say, see if there are questions at the back of the book, that uh, you know, back of the chapter, um, which ought to clue me in as to what the author thinks is important. And um, as I'm surveying these things, I'm going to, let's say I use that yellow highlighter, and I'm going to highlight um, all the headings in yellow and maybe some key points and some bold-faced words. So I'm just doing kind of a preview of the text. Then I'm going to take what I've looked at that and say, well, what do I already know about this subject? Um, uh, maybe take some of those headers and turn them into questions uh, so that I can anticipate what I'm going to learn. Let's, let's say I'm in a history book and it says, um, uh, history book says, um, uh, you know, causes of the Civil War. So let me turn that into a question. What are the causes of the Civil War? I could reasonably expect to learn that um, uh, in the text. So I'm, so at this point, when I go to read, which is the third step, I'm going to be actually looking for answers to those questions, which I could then highlight, uh, identify key points, supporting details, highlight those in colors, um, I can answer my questions using text notes, those questions I pose to myself. And then, and this is kind of a key point, after I've read through, let's say, each paragraph, each section, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to summarize the main points in my own words. And this is very important because it uses a different part of your brain, and, and it, it kind of helps to force that information, putting stuff in your own words kind of helps to force that information into the deeper recesses of your memory, all right? And um, so I may use the text tools, I may use the voice notes, and just, just you know, especially if I'm a, if, let's I'd say I'm a, a very good verbal learner, I'm just going to put the voice note thing on there and just summarize what I think I just read verbally. I may never listen to it again, okay? But um, um, doing it, that actually makes it important. And then if I have extracted, you know, those highlights into a separate study guide, um, I can go and, um, you know, pull those off to, uh, you know, a separate study guide and review those later and, and test myself. Okay. And I see some questions uh, coming up on the side here. Uh, any other cheaper options to... Um, well, you could always use the uh, Read and Write for Google. That's, um, that's like, <laughs> I really probably shouldn't mention prices and stuff uh, in, in the presentation, but it, it has a subscription base. And if the school has access to it, you can get it uh, fairly cheap. And of course, it's free for teachers. That's not going to help the students. But 
Um, uh, so th there are there are other different options you might want to look into, and if you have some questions on that, after looking at my website, uh, just go and shoot me an email, and I'll be happy to answer that. Okay. Um, anyway, so let's move on to the idea of using inspiration as a note taker. Um, so in one of my earlier slides, I mentioned uh, I think about four or five back here. I mentioned the idea of either highlighting information in the text itself, in the body of the text itself, whether that's e-text or a physical book. But in some cases, students might do better by actually lifting that information and putting it into a separate predefined template, kind of like those note-taking templates I mentioned, OK? So um, here's an example of, uh, I have, uh, this is a screenshot. I've got um, uh, Kurzweil for, um, for the Mac on the left. And I have a predefined uh, fiction reading template on the right, where I've already got categories for who are the characters in the book. I'm reading Tale of Two Cities in this example. So I'm looking at, let's see, we've got characters over here, predefined template. Uh, here are the different characters. Here are the different events that happened. And I'm going to list stuff as I find them. What's nice about working with something like Inspiration, or you could use Microsoft Word if you really want to also, is that most of the text here you can just you know copy and paste it and just put it into that outline so what i'm doing is i'm distilling this into some sort of an organizational framework that's going to make it easier to study later all right um and uh so actually what i'm going to do here i'm going to show you kind of an extreme version of this i'm going to go back to my uh live feed so to speak and we're going to go to inspiration on this. Uh, hold on a second. I'm getting the mechanics of share my screen, share. Okay, so uh, Andy, can you confirm that you're looking at inspiration over here? Uh, yes, I see it. Yes, I see it. Okay, good. So this is a framework of a student. And by the way, this is a real student who did this. Um, uh, who's taking notes on um, uh, World War I. Now, I don't know in this particular case, because it's not my student, um, but uh, they're taking, they're taking um, notes. Um, you know, maybe this might have been provided by the teacher, this framework of saying, you know, what was the uh, text of the war? What were the causes? And I've already been given two clues here, nationalism and past history. Uh, what were the effects of the war? What happened afterward? What were important uh, uh, timeline issues? Who were important people? So this is a framework for me to collect information, you know, maybe from my reading. All right, let's close this down. And uh, so this is that framework filled out. And what's, what's important about this, and this is why I'm showing this to you, is um, the student, this particular student, does better by putting, by distilling information from numerous sources into an organizational framework, okay? So what they've done is they've taken information from, whether it's the web, might have been from their own notes.
in essence, uh, are flashcards. So I'm going to go back to uh, stop sharing and then go back to the main handout. And I got to wait for the slides to look minutes left. So I'm going to try to finish up quickly enough so we'll have at least a few minutes for uh, questions. All right. Um, okay, so we're dragging and dropping stuff into um, Google. And here's that Franz Ferdinand uh, or the <laughs> World War I example. So it's inspiration as an outline. Um, and what I'm using is I'm, I'm putting on the checklist tool and using that uh, to simulate flashcards. All right. So what about taking notes from actual print text? Is there a tool that can do that? Well, there are things called scanning pens. Um, and um, so a scanning pen is like a mini, uh, almost like a mini scanner and OCR engine. OCR is optical character recognition engine that is built into a pen, which might or might not be connected to a computer. This particular one I'm showing, which is a kind of an impressive model, it's called an Iris Pen 7. And you can tell the person is swiping their hand across the text in here. And this is connected by a cable to the USB port on the computer. It's very simple to operate. Um, essentially, when I swipe that pen, and you can see the little red light down here, um, when I swipe that pen across text, anything that it scans in and recognizes gets uploaded to the computer and is entered wherever I happen to have my cursor. So I can have inspiration open, and my cursor is in front of a particular piece of text, and um, the, um, uh, whatever I swipe that pin over is going to be entered into, assuming it's recognized properly, um, into that uh, place there. So it's a way of lifting text electronically from print text and putting it into a computer. Now, a few caveats on that. Um, number one, you do have to kind of hold the pen at, the, at, at a correct angle. There's a, there's a proper angle to hold it at. And you have to swipe at a constant speed and a, in a straight line. It might almost be helpful to use a straight edge and put it on the page. So if the student is not taking notes because they have fine motor issues or hand tremors or stuff like that, this might not be the best tool because it does require a, a adequate amount of fine motor skills. Also. Um, it's okay for like a line or two of text or a word here and there. I wouldn't use it for scanning entire pages of information in. <laughs> okay, so I've shown you the, the uh, iris pen here. You'll see on my website I mentioned something called a C pen, which is very similar. Um, some of them are self-contained and just capture the information in the pen. All right, so, so now we're into the third section, the third scenario, which is how do I catch and retrieval? So here I'm going to introduce the concept of using a uh, digital notebook. And a digital notebook is kind of the same as a, um, uh, I just went to the next slide here, it's kind of the same as a physical notebook, you know, a binder, a spiral notebook, except for the fact that um, Obviously, since you're working in the digital world, you can capture digital information. So that means I can capture all in one place, in one organizational framework. I can capture text. I can capture um, audio recordings, video recordings, uh, um, video and audio uh, from the web, text from the web, links to websites, pictures from my camera, you name it. I can put that in and have one consistent organizational framework for all of my learning, okay? Uh, and because it's digital, it's much easier to organize it later. Okay, so this is one of the advantages over, um, uh, you know, just doing handwritten notes. I can reorganize, I can add more information later. I can then annotate that information, such as highlighting it, um, kind of similar to what I showed you with Kurzweil. Uh, I can tag that information with, um, uh, dates or with keywords so that I can later pull up and say, pull up everything that's tagged with my report and voila, I'm just looking at just that information. All right. Um, so it has a couple of other tools that I think are worthwhile uh, pointing out, uh, one of which is uh, clipping um, digital information from the web and retaining a link to the source. 
Um, so let me show you, I'm, I'm, the two main ones I'd recommend uh, for this would be uh, OneNote, um, which is now available on multiple platforms. It used to be PC only. And also uh, Evernote, which is pretty much available on any electronic device, actually. So um, uh, it's actually easier if I show you this live. So once again, Andy, I am going to live here. I'm going to share my screen. And I'm going to open up OneNote. All right. And it's opening here. It's slowly opening here. So the one thing I like about OneNote um, over Evernote, uh, Evernote, as you'll see in a few slides, is more like a digital file cabinet than it is a digital notebook. All right. All right. And um, open here. <laughs> there we go, finally. All right. So uh, I'm going to go to over here. Let me just expand my screen so you can see more of it. So what I'm using this for, so I could take notes in my English class. So there's that framework I showed you early on of my note-taking template for English class that I've got where I have a place to put my homework assignments. I have a place to summarize thoughts after the class, take my notes. Uh, in history class, I'm going to annotate a document that I entered from elsewhere. There's for long-term, um, uh, what should I say, long-term cumulative um, uh, storage of information. Okay, I like to think of it as my external brain, all right? And uh, actually, what I'm going to do here, I'm going to go to the tech, I, I, I've been already in this mode, I want to show you what I'm getting to, uh, where I've clipped information from the web. So this is, this is information that I clipped from the web. And when I clipped it, it automatically uh, retained on the bottom here, here's the website you clipped it from. I didn't even have to do that on my own. So we're going to go back to the slide presentation so that I can show you that. And then we may have, uh, we'll have a few minutes left for questions here. So I'm going to click that, hit stop sharing. Um, so in the meantime, Andy, if you saw any like really, you know, really juicy questions that came up, be thinking about those that I might be able to answer in the last few minutes here, okay? Um, because I haven't really been paying too much attention to the chat there. It's, it's an executive function nightmare trying to kind of manage all these different windows open and, and monitor them at one time. <laughs> so um, anyway, so the idea is to use a, um, let me go back a few slides here, is to use 
the digital notebook as a cumulative knowledge bank of past learning. So there might be quick access reference to rote memory facts, to models of solved problems, um, anything like that. And, and this is uh, particularly helpful. I like to think of using it as your external brain, your auxiliary brain. And it can be particularly helpful for students, uh, or adults for that matter, who have problems with organization planning, various memory issues is maybe due to, you know, uh, TBI, um, some memory challenges, etc. Um, and uh, anyway, so let me go through a few more slides here. <clears throat> and then the last feature I want to point out here, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I've got to take a little sip of water. The, um, the last uh, thing I want to do is the idea of clipping to a digital notebook. So you're going to see this in OneNote and in Evernote. And uh, apparently I forgot to put a capital E on Evernote, but forgive me for that. Mm -hmm. And um, so what it is, is I can, let me show you a screenshot of this. So here I am, uh, I'm looking up, oh look, Microsoft launched learning tools for OneNote over on the side here. And by the way, I'm going to give this to those who are still online here. Um, as a homework assignment, go Google OneNote learning tools. All right, this is something that Microsoft just released. Um, they're going to have a table at our upcoming Education Revolution Conference in San Francisco on April 16th. Um, I coordinate the technology for that show. And um, uh, anyway, so it provides tools for uh, diverse learners, um, such as students who, who need text-to-speech and stuff like that, um, for OneNote, and it's built into OneNote. Um, it's currently only available for PCs, and the Mac version will come later. But anyway, I digress. Uh, the idea here is that what I've done is I'm in Chrome, and on my Chrome browser, uh, I have the little OneNote icon up here, and when I click that, it says, oh, do you want to capture the full page? Do you want to capture a section of the page? Or do you want to capture a full article? I tell it what I want to capture. I tell it what notebook I want to put it in and what page I want it on. And then I'm going to say, clip. All right? And when I do that, voila, it shows up in my OneNote on the proper page and it shows the link on the bottom where it came from. So at bibliography time, that's going to be very helpful. And finally, um, Evernote. Evernote is a little different from OneNote. Um, I like OneNote because it's, I'm going to flip back a few pages here. I like OneNote because it's laid out kind of in the same organizational framework that a regular binder would be. So it's easy for kids to grasp the organizational structure of that. Evernote is less like a notebook and more like a digital file cabinet. It's more like having, they, they call them notebooks, but it's more like having stacks of cards with no inherent order to them. Okay, and that, these are the notebooks shown. So I'm showing uh, on, on my Mac here, um, showing the um, uh, notebooks off on the side. And then here are the cards that are in that notebook. And then I can say, uh, pull up all the cards that are related to a particular topic or something. And then here's a particular um, note card, so to speak, that I pulled up. And I, I can put on those cards, I can put in any type of text. I can put an audio file, uh, video, audio recording, attach an outside file. I can do any of a number of things. But I guess the main distinction I'd make between OneNote and Evernote is Evernote's more like a digital file cabinet. OneNote excels is kind of like a digital notebook, all right? And uh, so just to finish up, uh, again, my personal philosophy is that, uh, you know, if you match students with the right tools and level the playing field for them, uh, students can, 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 it's just much more easy for them to uh, demonstrate their full potential. If anybody has any follow-up questions, last slide here, um, this is my contact information, along with a link to the AT Toolbox on my website. And at this point, I think I will um, turn it over to Andy, because I know he has a few other things to say. Okay, Andy? Yes. Thank this is Andy and John here, and give us uh, one moment, please. We're going over some of the questions that uh, the participants wanted answered. Um, also, we would like to mention uh, uh, for the participants to please uh, 
uh, go to the SurveyMonkey link that you see uh, in your main window there uh, after the, the presentation is fully done. Uh, it's very fast, and uh, having completed that, you'll receive a certificate of participation. John? Yeah, certainly. Um, so yeah, thanks, Andy, for giving um, the recap on how to fill up that survey there. Um, Shelly, um, here's kind of a couple questions for you um, that some folks had. So kind of looking at your comparison between OneNote and Evernote, one is kind of like a digital file cabinet, and the other is more kind of like a digital notepad. Um, we have a couple people asking about Google Drive, and they're kind of wondering um, what your opinions are um, of using that in a similar way to, say, Ever Evernote or uh, OneNote. Uh, you definitely could. Uh, you need to have a um, organizational structure, and this is this is where the strategies part comes in. So, regardless of whether you're using OneNote or Evernote or Google Drive, the key thing is to first think of what's my organizational structure, and how am I, and how am I going to find things when I need them. So, I mean, I like OneNote and Evernote because it kind of keeps everything in one place. But on the other hand, you can get very disorganized in those if you just keep capturing information and throwing them in there and you don't have that, like in OneNote, the tab set up first or in Evernote, have your individual notebook set up first. If you want to go to the trouble, you could set up a, um, you know, a very carefully organized, thoughtfully organized, I should say, um, a folder system in uh, Google Drive. Um, and, um, you know, file stuff there. And some people do prefer to do that. Um, but from the standpoint of, like, quick reference of little tidbits of information, like, you know, what's the screenshot for capturing a full screen on a Mac or something like that, or how do I multiply two binomials, it might be kind of nice to have a, a digital notebook that you can open on any device, whether it's iPad, just, just accessing the web version, and you're just using it as read only. And for younger kids, they definitely would be read only. Um, you know, older kids would be, um, you know, setting up their own organizational structure. So, next Great. question. Um, yeah, we have uh, an, another question here from um, Ellen. She's asking if you found any particularly helpful note taking strategies or tools um, for college students with, say, aphasia, post stroke, or a traumatic brain injury where writing and uh, spelling skills are a barrier. Well, um, obviously, in that case, and, I, and, and to be honest, I, I kind of stay away from making recommendations, what, what are called sidewalk assessments, where you make a recommendation based on knowing virtually nothing about the situation. Um, so, I mean, the first step is I would probably need to know more about the specifics of this uh, particular student. Um, so I think, in, based on what, uh, what Ellen wrote there, I would say... Um, the person needs to, the difficulty obviously is in rendering those ideas as language. That's, that's where the aphasia is going to come in. Okay, we're spelling and writing are barriers. Um, so you still want the person to have access to that information. So, um, you know, look at what are, what are his best ways um, to, um, uh, to access information. It might be recorded audio or recorded audio and then marking up the audio with some sort of a, a tag or node. It might be a single letter, a symbol that means something. And um, so that way you're kind of getting around the language issues, um, uh, especially if the information is coming in in audio in the first place. So, Other questions? Certainly, yeah. I'm uh, monitoring the uh, the chat here for some others, um, and kind of to piggyback on on your answer too, Shelley. Um, one thing to um, to kind of answer Ellen's question is, Shelley really kind of took a look at a lot of great tools here today. And what's nice is oftentimes you can pair two tools together. So, Ellen, for instance, for some of your spelling, one thing you could look is um, there's a lot of bro both applications and desktop programs that have advanced spell check. So, if you do some googling for um, an advanced spell checker or something called a contextual spell checker, that might give you a little bit more spelling support um, for that individual as well. Um, yeah. but, and, and, the other, and the other thing to tag on to what you just said, John, um, was the idea of like using it with word prediction that has word lists. 
So for instance, if you used CoWriter along with any of those digital notebook ideas and automatically clued in CoWriter as to what's the topic that I'm taking notes on, like Albert Einstein. So that way, typing just the first few letters, let's say you typed RE, it's going to come up with, you, are you trying to spell relativity? Okay, because it knows you're taking notes on Albert Einstein. So again, uh, it's a very good point you brought, John. You can always add multiple tools. You're working in the digital environment, have multiple tools working together. Fantastic. Well, um, well, yeah, it looks like the chat has kind of slowed down here. Um, so I just want to thank everyone so much for coming tonight. And of course, a big thank you to Shelly. This is a big topic to tackle, and I think you did it in a really great comprehensive way. So thank you so much, Shelly. Um, for your time here this evening and everyone um, we hope to see you back here at another CTD cafe event so feel free to check out um, ctd.org slash cafe um, or ctd institute I should say dot org slash cafe um, for more upcoming events so thanks everyone for joining and we hope to see you soon thank you Shelley okay you're quite welcome <laughs> I'm just reading the comments coming up here <laughs> <laughs>